we simply cannot allow people to pour into the United States undetected, undocumented, unchecked. And complete the dang fence. This bill that we will sign today is not a revolutionary bill. Cast down your bucket where you are. We come from France. And I am, you know, adamantly against illegal immigrants. They're coming in by the thousands, just unbelievable. A Deal. wall is an immorality. Who are you rooting for? Those masters of the universe are at it again. You maniac! You blew it up! Welcome to Parsing Immigration Policy, the podcast of the Center for Immigration Studies. My name is Mark Krikorian, Executive Director of the Center. And this week, we are offering another panel discussion as our podcast. And this one is an interesting, they're all interesting, of course, but this one I think is important maybe more than others because it relates to the impeachment of DHS Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. The House impeached him, approved the articles of impeachment in February, delivered them in April to the Senate. But rather than holding a trial, which is what has been done in every other impeachment in American history, whichever way the, you know, the, the trial went, but there was always a trial, this time Senator Schumer, the majority leader in the Senate, basically just spiked it, voted not to have it even considering the evidence in a trial and just making the whole thing go away. They voted to adjourn the impeachment is the way they put it. Well, in lieu of a actual trial to air the evidence for the impeachment of Secretary Mayorkas, a uh, second best uh, option we decided was to have a panel discussion with the chairman of the House committee that actually oversaw the impeachment process. And this week, we had a panel discussion on Capitol Hill with Mark Green, Congressman Mark Green, who's chairman of the House Committee on Homeland Security, which is where the impeachment resolution originated. And not just the resolution, but the reports over a period of months beforehand, laying out in chapter and verse the case for impeachment. This was not just something they made up because they didn't like the guy's politics. And that was never allowed to be aired, really, not properly. And so this is what we tried to do. So in the panel discussion, Congressman Green, Chairman Green speaks first. He's followed by Paul Taylor, who was a staff member for many years, the chief counsel, in fact, for the House Subcommittee on the Constitution, has ushered many bills through Congress, has extensive experience in this area, even as a visiting fellow at George Mason Law School. And he was one of the people who helped actually prepare the resolution. He's going to talk about it. And also George Fishman, who was on the center's staff, of course. He's been on our podcast before, but he took a, an unpaid leave of absence to work with Mr. Taylor and Chairman Green in doing the impeachment resolution because he had many years of experience on the Judiciary Committee you know, relating to these exact areas. So we're going to be hearing from Chairman Green, Paul Taylor, and George Fishman. And we're starting with Chairman Green. Well, thank you. And I, I got to thank CIS for, you know, putting this panel together. I think uh, you're right. It's uh, plan C or D. <laughs> exactly. uh, it would have been great for the Senate to actually hear the arguments for the case prior to dismissing it. But uh, we recognize their action was a political action and a political decision. Um, and unfortunately, uh, they did what they did. Uh, I have to thank you, too, for loaning us, George. Um, he and, and Paul have been instrumental in the construction of this. You know, a lot of times you see something that's wrong, you know it's wrong, you can't quite articulate it. Um, and these guys helped us understand how best articulate what we knew was clearly uh, wrong actions, harmful actions to our country that needed to be addressed. And both of these guys were the firepower behind the construct of the argument. And so uh, thank you for loaning them to us. Um, you know, how we, how we got here, um, 
when this president took office, he hired a secretary. And that secretary, by taking the oath to defend the Constitution, owned uh, some very specific responsibilities, one of which was to secure our southwest border. And it's very interesting what the laws passed by the Congress say. And that's really critical here to, uh, to, to determining what a high crime and misdemeanor is and getting into the weeds of all this is to understand at the 100,000 foot level, Congress has said your responsibility if you step into this role is to secure our border. And we all know that has been an abysmal failure. Um, but the, they immediately in, did away with, I think it's 89, the numbers get uh, debated, but I, I think the best number is 89 policies of the former administration that were a part of securing the border, that the then sitting leadership in the organization said these work. And they had made campaign promises along the campaign trail to open the border to create uh, catch and release. And so they did away with policies that, that effectively secured the border. They created an open border and people tested it. Um, and as people tested it, they phoned home. And then they created a migration crisis by opening the border and creating an incredible pull factor or incentive that drove people from 160 nations to come to our border and walk across and come into the United States and be released. And, you know, our adversaries, and I use the term adversary about the drug cartels, purposefully uh, took advantage of this situation. And they created schemes to facilitate this mass wave of migration. Our enemies took advantage of this open border to disrupt our nation and to put our nation at risk uh, through things like China bringing fentanyl into the United States purposefully to harm the country. Um, all because of the open border. The mass migration came, the cartels profited to the tune of 13 to $15 billion a year, um, putting money into the hands of people who absolutely hate our country and have done nothing but harm killing Americans, uh, creating crime nexuses, nexuses that um, will, will be decades cleaning up. And the detriment to our communities, the detriment to our states all across the country, we use the term all the time about um, every state's a border state, every state city's a border city. I mean, it's absolutely true. And it's because of those policies that were done away with and policies. But then they went a step further. They, they took the laws that we've written by Congress and purposefully subverted those laws and ignored those laws, creating policies and structures to facilitate the catch and release program to get as many people into the country as they humanly possibly could, because that was their intention all along. And those policies and the subversion of the laws, the ignorance of the laws, the ignoring of the laws, um, further worsened the situation. To the extent of telling in a memorandum the, the personnel in the employees of DHS, to not follow the laws passed by Congress. Our laws were pretty clear. And very interestingly, the INA says shall detain, says things like this, for example, with people they confirm have felony convictions in other countries. That isn't a reason to not send someone back, to detain them and send them back when the law clearly says that it is. And so at the higher and more deep, deeper level to a guy who at 17 took the oath to defend the Constitution, at a higher level, a more, uh, I think, offensive thing is just a disregard for the Constitution. You know, our founders were brilliant when they, when they took the ideas of Montesquieu and Locke and said, you know, if we concentrate power into the hands of just a few people, we'll create a tyranny. If we want freedom will spread power out. And so they created three separate co-equal branches of government, one that writes the laws and one that executes the laws. And on impeachment after impeachment in the past, on hearings oversighting the uh, executive branch, 
From Iran-Contra to way back, these experts provided examples of where even the Democrats said you don't get to pick and choose which laws you're going to enforce executive branch. You have to, you have to follow the Constitution and execute those laws. And from a granular level, what is a high crime and misdemeanor for me? Well, a, a lawless cabinet secretary who completely disregards the laws passed by a co-equal branch of government subverts those laws. That, to me, is a high crime and a misdemeanor. The founders were at least clear on this point. The executive branch doesn't get to just totally disregard the laws passed by Congress. That tears at the foundation of the nation. It tears at the Constitution, the, the document that we swear an oath to defend. I've always been fascinated by something, uh, and I think it was uh, Mark Milley who actually uh, made this point in a speech where I was listening to him promote someone. He said, you know, we don't take an oath to the people. We don't take an oath to defend the flag. We don't take an oath to defend the terrain. The, we take an oath to defend the Constitution. And that's the same exact oath that Alejandro Mayorkas took and completely and totally disregarded. And having a lawless cabinet secretary who gets to pick and choose which laws they want, I'm sorry, that's a road to concentrating power into the hands of fewer and fewer people and a road to tyranny. And it's unacceptable to me. And that's why we went forward with this. But we got here because they did what they did, resulted in the crisis, and then they doubled down on the policies of catch and release and the violation of the laws passed by this body. And that can't be accepted. Next is Paul Taylor. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. It was a pleasure to work with Chairman Green and his staff. It was a, um, an absolute pleasure. I learned a lot, and hopefully I can explain in a relatively short period of time what we learned during this impeachment investigation and um, prosecution. Take a step back, try to give you the essentials mm -hmm. of the narrative as I understand it. Let's go back to the Constitution. They're drafting the Constitution, they wanted to create an impeachment clause to remove high executive officials um, because they knew the criminal law was not adequate to remove bad actors. So at the Constitutional Convention, there was a debate. What, what standard uh, should govern high executive officials being able to remain in office? The, the phrase maladministration was thrown out there. But Madison objected to that. He said, no, we don't want a standard where it's just um, where you can remove someone just for being a clumsy administrator. We want to go to what was proposed next, which was the phrase high crimes and misdemeanors. Now, that may say, seem vague to some people today, but at the time it was imported into the Constitution because it had a clear history of application in England for over 100 years. That was the phrase, high crimes and misdemeanors. Now, that was ultimately the standard put into the Constitution. Now, what does that mean? A high crime, and I think, although there's some debate on this, whether high modifies misdemeanor as well, I think it does. A high misdemeanor, what is that? It was understood to mean um, not a petty crime as we understand it today, but a um, misconduct in your demeanor in high office. A high, off, uh, a high misdemeanor was misdemeaning yourself in your conducting of a high office. And that's really the central part of the impeachment claim against Mayorkas. Fast forward, that becomes part of the Constitution. The first Congress, James Madison, is elected to the first Congress. There is debate on whether to create a Department of Foreign Affairs, which ultimately became the State <coughs> Department. There is objection on the House floor. Let's not create this department, people say, because there could be bad actors. There could be really bad people that have a lot of power in this department. And James Madison says, no, wait a minute. Relax, we can go ahead and create this department because we have the power of impeachment and we can remove through impeachment unworthy men, his phrase, uh, who may occupy this office. You know, not referring to the president, but to some unworthy men that might be appointed to these positions. Joseph Story was one of the first great commentators on the Constitution. He wrote a, um, a, a treatise that described some of the major precedents under high crimes and misdemeanors in England, which included multiple examples, for example, of admirals in England who failed to control their borders at sea, opened them up to invasion, opened them up to harm. These were all considered impeachable offenses for their neglect of duty. So fast forward today to the case of uh, Secretary Mayorkas. Now, there are two things that make this impeachment unique, I think, in constitutional history. The first is 
The subject of the violations involve federal statutes that explicitly deny prosecutorial discretion to high executive officials. They say, for example, 8 uh, U.S.C. 1226C, if a border agent comes across a, an illegal alien and through their database check or otherwise, they're determined that to have, um, have been convicted of an aggravated felony, which is defined in the statute as things like murder, sex trafficking, drugs, you shall detain that person. Doesn't mean you have to go around and find these people in the weeds, but insofar as you encounter them, you must detain them. So the secretary, in the face of that statute, um, on September uh, 20, 30th, 2021, issues a memo. And it's got his signature on it, and it's all publicly available. So much of this impeachment is also unique because parts of it were like almost gift wrapped with a bow and sent to Congress because this is public information. These are policies they were proud of. This was not a matter of having to subpoena people and dig up information about what you hid or didn't hide from Congress. Um, you know, in Watergate, it was, uh, you know, the abuse of power in that way. And, you know, the first Trump impeachment, it was um, contempt of Congress. This was all in the open and fully litigated. So this September 30th, 2021 memo that Mayorkas uh, sends out says, the decision how to exercise prosecutorial discretion can be complicated and requires investigative work. Our personnel should not rely on the fact of conviction or the result of a database search alone. That is an absolute 180 degree violation of the requirements of the federal statute. This was litigated. Um, Texas, United States v. Texas. Texas says this is a, obviously an unconstitutional order to his entire staff to violate federal law. And the lower court agrees. Um, and it goes up to the uh, Fifth Circuit Court of Appeal. And the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals agrees that this is a clear violation of the law. And then it goes up to the Supreme Court and things get interesting. The Supreme Court takes the case and uh, the decision says, the majority decision, which was this kind of mixed uh, uh, group of Kavanaugh, Roberts, and the three liberal justices. And they say, well, wait a minute here. This sounds like an issue to us of um, whether there's too much or too little enforcement on the part of the administration. We don't think, this was the five-person majority, that this um, is an issue that we should decide ourselves as the judicial branch. We think this is a decision for Congress. Now, they leave open how Congress should handle this. They list a variety of tools that Congress has. But the important point is that during the oral argument in that case, the oral argument in a case is when the justices and the litigants much more openly discuss the practical ramifications of what their decision might be. Justices don't want to be blindsided by some uh, consequence of their decision that they didn't fully explore. So during the oral argument, you'll see a lot more blunt questions and blunt answers. And what happens at the oral argument is the Solicitor General of the United States, who is charged with um, articulating the Biden administration's official policy position, um, she's arguing to the court that they should not, there, there should be no jurisdiction in this case, they, they shouldn't even answer the question. And this is what Justice Kavanaugh says to the Solicitor General of the United States during the oral argument. I think your position is, instead of judicial review, Congress has to resort to shutting down the government or impeachment or dramatic steps. If some administration comes in and says we're not going to enforce laws, or at least not going to enforce the laws to the degree that Congress by law has said the law should be enforced. That's 8 U.S.C. 1226C. And that's forcing, I mean, I understand your position, but it's forcing Congress to take dramatic steps, I think. And the Solicitor General responds, well, I think that if those dramatic steps would be warranted, it would be in the face of a dramatic abdication of statutory responsibility by the executive, which is exactly what an unconstitutional order to your entire staff to violate a clear federal statute is. So that was the quid pro quo. That was the quid pro quo. Court, if you deny, jurisdiction here and you don't answer this question, um, we will take our chances with impeachment. Now notice Kavanaugh just flags impeachment and shutting down the government. Well, of course, shutting down the government is no 
solution here because if you deny funds to the administration, they won't have any funds to implement the law. And if you give them more funds, you'll just be wasting money because they've demonstrated that they're not going to enforce the law. So the only practical remedy here is, was, is impeachment. And in fact, the concurring justices all agreed. They said, of course, the states have suffered vast harm. Their health care costs have gone up. Um, their crime rates have gone up. Of course, there is harm. So that left the Senate as the sole source of relief after the House pass the impeachment articles over to the Senate. You would think that the senators would understand that they have a unique responsibility to defend the interests of the states. They are unique in our federal system for being elected statewide. So they do have a special obligation to the states. They are no longer elected by state legislatures, but they're still elected statewide. The fact that so many senators voted for Schumer's proposition that somehow this was an unconstitutional move by the House is really outrageous in the sense of they're, vi they're violating their duty to their own state interests. So if you really look at what Schumer said, he said, well, this was unconstitutional on the part of the House. Well, he couldn't have meant that it was unconstitutional for the House to consider articles of impeachment. That's in the Constitution. The Constitution requires the Senate to evaluate through a trial in the admission of evidence whether or not this was a constitutional or unconstitutional impeachable offense. Did it rise to that level or not? So when Senator Schumer says, we're going to vote to dismiss this right away because he thinks it's unconstitutional, that is like the Queen of Hearts in Alice in Wonderland who said, verdict first, trial later. But it's much worse. He ended up saying, uh, verdict first, no trial ever. Much worse than the Queen of Hearts. And the entire point of the process was for the senators to hear the evidence as to whether or not this was an impeachable offense. And he denied even that most minimal step, effectively negating the impeachment clause, writing it out of the Constitution, okay. leaving it now just to voters to decide whether or not um, the senators who supported that principle or lack of principle um, might be punished at the ballot box. Next is George Fishman. Thank you so much, Mark, and uh, Chairman Green. Uh, it was such a privilege to cap off my congressional career working for you and the American people uh, on the impeachment proceedings, and I just thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for being here. I was actually involved in two impeachments in my career as a congressional staffer, President Bill Clinton and DHS Secretary Mayorkas. Um, upon evaluation, I consider the Mayorkas impeachment the more compelling. One involved what the meaning of is is. The second involved what the meaning of American sovereignty is and what the point is of Congress passing laws if the executive branch chooses to flout them. The, as Paul indicated, the catalyst for the House's extraordinary action was a decision by the Supreme Court last June. The decision, U.S. v. Texas, dramatically altered the balance of power between the executive branch, Congress, and the states in instances where the executive branch chooses to less than fully execute the immigration laws of the nation. The decision left the House with little choice but to impeach Alexandro Mayorkas, at least should it desire to preserve its constitutional prerogatives and protect the states from the disastrous consequences of Secretary Mayorkas's willful and systemic refusal to comply with federal immigration law. As uh, Chairman Green's uh, committee report on the impeachment noted, the Supreme Court agreed to hear a case involving the very same unilateral suspensions of the federal immigration laws by Secretary Mayorkas that are at issue in this impeachment. Uh, mandatory detention of uh, criminal aliens and other aliens uh, in the U.S. unlawfully in certain instances. The Fifth Circuit concluded that Mayorkas's actions had every indication of being a general policy that is so extreme as to amount to an abdication of statutory responsibility, and that the replacement of Congress's statutory mandates is plainly outside the bounds of the powers conferred by the Immigration and Nationality Act. Secretary Mayorkas's actions and beliefs have disturbing parallels to those alleged in the congressional investigation of the Reagan administration's so-called Iran-Contra affair. Two congressional committees, one House, one Senate, took part in the investigation, 
finding that certain administration officials display disdain for constitutional processes and the legislative branch. When Congress disagreed with these officials' deeply held beliefs, they allegedly decided to ignore the duly enacted laws of, passed by Congress. The committees concluded <coughs> The common ingredients of the policies were secrecy, deception, and disdain for the law. A small group of senior officials believed that they alone knew what was right. In the Iran-Contra affair, officials viewed the law not as sending, setting boundaries for their actions, but raising impediments to their goals. When the goals and the law collided, the law gave way. The committees went on. Former officials lectured us that a rightful cause justified any means, and that Congress is to blame for passing laws that run counter to administration policy. What, might be aptly, what may aptly be called the cabal of the zealots was in charge. Con government officials must observe the law even when they disagree with it. These were the Democrat-led committees investigating the Reagan administration. Independent counsel Lawrence Walsh, who uh, did the criminal side of it, concluded that the crimes committed in Iran-Contra were motivated by the desire of persons in high office to pursue controversial policies and goals, even when the pursuit of those policies and goals was restricted by statutes or the constitutional system of checks and balances. Secretary Mayorkas has apparently come to the conclusion that he and his cabal of the zealots alone know what is right, alone have a monopoly on the truth. DHS detention, they've decided, is morally inexcusable, and the law has to give way to mass release by any means necessary, especially because Congress is to blame for passing mandatory detention laws in the first place. I'm frankly surprised the secretary hasn't chained himself to a building at Columbia University yet. <laughs> to those who say Mayorkas was just carrying out orders, let me quote independent counsel Walsh. When a president chooses to skirt the laws or to circumvent them, it is incumbent upon his subordinates to resist, not join in. Their oath and fealty are to the Constitution and the rule of law, not to the man temporarily occupying the Oval Office. Um, Paul has very well explained the basis of the impeachment uh, in, in the U.S. versus Texas uh, decision. Um, I I should just um, raise a few points which were raised in opposition uh, to the impeachment uh, in during markup on the House floor, things of that nature. A lot has been made of the fact that Justice Kavanaugh's opinion itself does not actually contain the word impeachment. Uh, Representative Glenn Ivey argued at, at the markup that the chairman and others have made the point that the only remedy available is impeachment. That's not what Kavanaugh wrote. He does not mention impeachment. The articles of impeachment rely on Justice Alito's language. He's the sole dissenter in this case. However, Justice Kavanaugh clearly understood impeachment to be one of the arrows that his decision left in Congress's quiver. Um, Paul has explained what happened at oral argument and Secretary Biden's uh, solicitor general saying that the dramatic abdication of statutory responsibility that can warrant impeachment. Um, Senator Schumer uh, justified his unprecedented and irresponsible dismissal of the House articles by claiming they're constitutional. He might have first checked with President Biden's Solicitor General uh, as to that view. It's not even accurate to say that Justice Kavanaugh's opinion itself doesn't touch on impeachment. In the, decision, in the opinion, immediately after writing, for example, Congress possesses an array of tools uh, uh, to address uh, executive branch misdeeds. He referred to sup two Supreme Court cases and two specific pages in those Supreme Court cases. Well, what did those decisions say? The first, the 1997 decision, Reigns versus Byrd, on the page referenced by Kavanaugh, it said the Tenure of Office Act provided that an official whose appointment to an executive branch office requir uh, requiring confirmation by the Senate could not be removed without the consent of the Senate. In 1868, President Johnson removed his Secretary of War. Within a week, the House of Representatives impeached Johnson. One of the principal charges against him was that his removal 
violated the Tenure of Office Act. That was the page specifically referenced in Justice Kavanaugh's opinion. In the other opinion from 1993, the court on the page referenced by Kavanaugh stated that we hardly need to note that an agency's decision to ignore congressional expectations may expose it to grave political consequences. And what is more grave than impeachment? Columbia University professor Philip Bobbitt uh, has argued that the Republicans misread Justice Alito, that he wasn't embracing impeachment as an alternative. He was trying to hold it back. Bobbitt also said it's a travesty, the impeachment, because it completely turns Alito's opinion on its head. He is not coming out for interbranch warfare. Professor Bobbitt totally missed the point. Of course, uh, Justice Alito was not coming out in favor of interbranch warfare. Rather, he said ruefully that the court now says that no party injured by this policy is allowed to challenge it in court. So in the terrible situation into which Justice Alito believed Kavanaugh's opinion had placed Congress and the states, quote unquote, disruptive measures such as impeachment were the quote, unquote, only limit on the power of the president uh, of a president to disobey the law. In Representative Dan Bishop's paraphrasing of Alito, I don't think this is a wise decision to make, but that is the decision the majority made. And if you want the law to be followed, you're going to have to impeach somebody. That's where uh, Justice Alito was. Justice Kavanaugh put the House in the position of having to bring impeachment proceedings. That was quite a June swoon for the Kavanaugh court. court. Justin Driver, a law professor at the University of Chicago Law School, has written or wrote before Kavanaugh's confirmation that a dominant narrative of the Supreme Court during the last five decades has been the apostasy of Republican appointed justices. Kavanaugh's confirmation would almost certainly spell the end of that storyline and cement a generation of GOP constitutional orthodoxy. Well, reports of the death of the apostasy story have been greatly exaggerated. As David Savage wrote in the LA Times, the crucial battle these days within the Supreme Court are among its six conservatives, not between them and the three liberals. The outcomes in close cases now turn most often on one justice, Brett Kavanaugh. Twice, Kavanaugh played a key role in upholding Biden's immigration policies against lawsuits brought uh, by Texas Republicans. And that uh, is what brought impeachment to the House floor. Thanks. The full panel discussion, which also includes Q&A after the presentations, is on our website if you want to view it. It's at cis.org. And uh, that's it for this week's episode of Parsing Immigration Policy. As usual, if you have any comments, complaints, suggestions for future programs, email us at center at cis.org. And I hope to see you next week. <laughs>